Thank you so much, Giovanni. Hi, it's morning for me here. Good afternoon to you. Um, thank you to the uh, Magnetic Society Italy chapter for this um, invitation to be here. So I'll say a few words about the Magnetic Society. Uh, it is the leading professional organization to bring together scientists in the field of magnetism in, ev in events just like this one today. So if you're not already a member of the Magnetic Society, I encourage you to go to the website and consider joining to become part of this great community. So I am at Western Digital in California. Western Digital is a data storage company. Our main products in mass production are hard disk drives, which are a magnetic data storage device, and solid state drives, which are based on NAND flash. I will not be talking about these products today. Instead, I'm very excited to tell you about the work, the cool things we're doing in MRAM in the research division of Western Digital. So in this talk today, I will also be talking about magnetic tunnel junctions. Uh, I'll give you an introduction to MTJs and to STT MRAM, and then I'll talk about the challenges toward achieving a high density STT MRAM. I'll highlight some work at Western Digital where we've tried to lower the switching current by free layer engineering, and also a demonstration of um, etching MRAM bits at tight pitch. And then I'll conclude. Okay. Um, so the software is kind of hiding part of my screen here. So um, I want to introduce the MTJ. It is the basic unit for storing a bit in MRAM. And it was introduced by Michel Julier uh, uh, while he was a PhD student in his thesis. He introduced a model for tunneling between two ferromagnets separated by an insulating tunnel barrier. When you pass a current, you are in a low resistance state for when the two ferromagnets are magnetized, um, their magnetization is oriented parallel to each other. You're in a high resistance state when the magnetizations are oriented anti-parallel to each other. And this only works because spin is conserved in the tunneling process. This is something that we take for granted now, but it was shown experimentally in a really nice set of experiments just a few years prior, and it inspired the work of uh, Julien. And it wasn't until 20 years later that uh, there was the first experiments showing TMR, tunnel magnet resistance, at room temperature for the first time in 1995. This was done in amorphous aluminum oxide tunnel barriers. And it's this discovery alone that opened the door to a lot of applications of magnetotunnel junctions that we have today. Then in 2001, there was a prediction of very high TMR in epitaxial MGO tunnel barriers uh, with iron electrodes. And just a few years later, that was experimentally confirmed very high uh, TMR uh, for MGO. And then it progressed reaching over um, 600 percent at room temperature. So the earliest products for MTJ, they were introduced in, in 2004 by Seagate as the reed head and hard disk drives. And since then, there are magnetic tunnel junctions and every hard drive produced since then, even today. The very first ones used uh, titanium oxide tunnel barriers. And then also another major application, toggle MRAM, first introduced by Freescale, now Everspin, 2006. Um, that uses aluminum oxide tunnel barriers. So all of us today, we are using uh, magnetic tunnel junctions every day. For example, this video is being recorded right now. It's going through the cloud, through Zoom to go to a hard drive in a data center somewhere. And then if somebody wants to watch it sometime in the future, it's a magnetic tunnel junction that'll read it from the hard drive. So on this uh, application for toggle MRAM, they're still um, uh, very active in making the toggle MRAM products now. Um, so in this technology, it's a magnetic, uh, the magnetic field generated by current pulses and bit and word lines that is used to write the magnetization in the free layer, to write the bit. This kind of writing scheme, it does not scale well. 
later um, developed spin transfer torque MRAM. This uses spin transfer torque to write the magnetization in the free layer of the MTJ bit. So this kind of write scheme, it does scale well. And uh, let me move this here. It's SCT MRAM that um, will move forward to achieve higher density. And you can see that here uh, in this image, there are 16 um, tunnel perpendicular MTJ bits in, of STT MRAM in just the area of one um, toggle MRAM bit. Okay. And there are um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, products being produced now of STT MRAM. It is um, embedded uh, MRAM. Let's see. Um, this, uh, these companies here are partnering with foundries to produce uh, STT MRAM as it scales better than um, embedded flash at the 22 nanometer technology node. Okay, so what is a SCT MRAM cell? It is a one transistor, one MTJ. The transistor supplies the right current to switch the magnetization of the free layer to be parallel or anti-parallel to the reference layer, and there's no magnetic field required here. So it's a magnetic device that does not need a magnetic field. And Jonathan went through spin transfer torque. I'll just um, highlight a few things here for when a uh, current is passed through the tunnel junction by conservation of angular momentum, the free layer feels a torque acting upon it by the polarized electrons from the reference layer. If the incoming electric current is high enough, then the torque is large enough to switch the magnetization. So I'll just highlight here that the spin transfer torque is directly opposing the damping torque that wants to bring the magnetization back in line with the effective field. So for this reason, um, to have the most efficient spin transfer torque, we want to minimize the damping parameter of the free layer material. Okay, so this is just a demonstration of the reading and writing of the MTJ in the MRAM cell. So if we start with reading here, the high resistance state for anti-parallel alignment, this is a bit one, then we want to write to the parallel state, you apply high enough voltage across, uh, beyond the critical voltage to switch the free layer into the low resistance state that you can read here at low bias, it's a bit zero. And then uh, to write from the parallel to the anti-parallel state, you apply a negative voltage to switch the free layer again. So if you wanna take this same device and just, uh, switch by a uh, field, then it would look like this. And the re reversal mechanism happens by either coherent rotation, so that's for a single domain, for bit sizes, let's say less than 25 nanometers. For larger um, bit sizes, the switching happens by domain wall nucleation and propagation. And whether you have the single domain or the multi-domain, that'll depend on the exchange constant A and the effective anisotropy energy. So this is a micromagnetic <clears throat> micromagnetic modeling here showing that it's uh, you get faster switching by coherent rotation for the smallest uh, devices here. This is compared to um, domain wall motion for larger devices um, that takes a uh, longer time for switching, especially if you have a low value for the exchange constant compared to higher. Okay, so I'll just review on um, the some the major concepts for SCT MRAM. So um, the switching happens by spin transfer torque. It's characterized by um, critical switching current density. You'll see here that this is largely dependent on a lot of properties of the free layer. So the damping parameter, the saturation magnetization thickness, and anisotropy field. The reading is done by measuring um, tunnel magnetic resistance. The retention or non-volatility, it's due to the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy energy of the free layer um, characterized by the thermal stability factor. And this is typically uh, reported as the time, let's say a number of years, until a thermally activated reversal occurs. 
Endurance, this is needed for reliability. Uh, it's often reported as the number of write cycles reached before a specified failure rate, for example, a failure rate of 10 parts per million. Okay. And different MRAM products will require different um, specifications on these parameters. For example, embedded flash products, those are um, have tunnel junction sizes above 40 nanometers. So in the domain wall reversal regime, retention 10 years at elevated operating temperature, right current above 100 microamps, TMR around 100%, endurance a million cycles. But if you want to get to a higher density, uh, MRAM, for example, a, a replacement for DRAM, you're going to need tunnel junctions that are a lot smaller, 20 nanometers or less, a right currents also a lot smaller, TMR needs to be high, approaching even 300%, and then unlimited endurance, 10 to the 17. And the reason why you would want to achieve um, such a high performing memory is because we're entering this era of big data where there are massive storage and performance requirements for applications such as the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, in self-driving cars, there's real-time processing of visual data. So you want to have an effective memory architecture, with low latency, low power. And so there's this need to bring this high performance memory closer to the computing units. And this motivates us to look at SCT MRAM as a new physical me mechanism uh, for these applications better than what's available now. But there are a lot of challenges to trying to achieve uh, a high density uh, MRAM where the cell size is 20 nanometers or less. So when you reduce the volume of the cell to compensate for that, you have to increase the perpendicular magnetic and isotropy uh, to maintain thermal stability for data retention. But at the same time, you need to reduce the switching current density because very high currents will cause breakdown of the MGO barrier. It's the main cause of endurance failures. And small transistors at uh, tight pitch can only supply very small current. Another major challenge here for this area moving forward is the ability to etch MRAM bits at tight pitch. And to do so while maintaining tight distributions of your properties. And then you're gonna need to have very high TMR, uh, even getting to 300% to compensate for the wider distributions that you're gonna have at small cell sizes. So I want to focus in on this, uh, these requirements here and this tricky trade-off here. You want to increase PMA by increasing saturation, magnetization, and anisotropy field. That's also going to increase your, um, your switching current density. And so then the damping um, parameter becomes very important here. And we've given some tries to engineer the, the free layer to try to reduce the switching current. So I'll show you um, this work here. We took the conventional free layer. It's usually 20 to 24 angstroms thick. It's made up of a cobalt iron boron between the MGO tunnel barrier, MGO cap. And then um, typically there is a heavy metal spacer inserted. The purpose of that is to act as a boron sink for the boron atoms. It gives it some place for the boron atoms to diffuse away during the post annealing step. But the tungsten in there, it reduces the saturation magnetization and increases the damping. So we want to minimize that tungsten amount as much as possible. So we do that by substantially substantially reducing the free layer thickness. So we go to thinner free layers and we can go to less tungsten and this brings better magnetic properties. And we found that the properties in improve even further by taking this same tungsten spacer thickness and splitting it into two thinner layers. So here's an image of a 13 angstrom free layer between an MGO barrier and an MGO cap. And so we made these free layers in the uh, thickness series for 17 angstroms and then thinning down 13 and 12 angstroms. This allows us to reduce the tungsten spacer thickness. And so that led to uh, substantially higher saturation magnetization and lower um, damping parameter and also um, higher exchange constant, um, reaching what is known as the bulk value for iron. Okay. So we proceeded to make bottom pinned STT MRAM devices here with diameters 50 to 
uh, 55 to 130 nanometers, and we saw um, TMR values in the range of 100 to 125 percent. Okay, and then we determined the thermal stability factor from field switching probability measurements, where the results were fit to a, a model for domain wall switching. This gave us the domain wall width, domain wall energy density, and then the thermal stability factor that comes from the domain wall energy density times the di di diameter, the film thickness over KBT. And we see that it's the thinnest uh, free layers in the series that have a lot higher domain wall energy density leading to um, a high maintaining a high thermal stability factor, even though these are very thin uh, layers. We determined the critical switching current density, and we found that it's the thinner free layers that have 30% lower um, switching current um, compared to the thickest free layer in the series, the 17 angstrom one. So with this lower switching current density and um, still higher, a high thermal stability factor, then it's these thinner free layers that have um, the best spin transfer torque efficiency, this figure of merit um, defined as uh, delta the thermal stability factor over the critical current. And then the other um, work I want to highlight is uh, our work to etch the MRAM bits at tight pitch. We were trying to achieve a 50 nanometer full pitch array with separated bits and do a demo of electrical testing to, to verify the switching. So there have been a, a, a lot of reports of um, MRAM bits, very small, 20 nanometers or less, um, but these are isolated bits. There have been very few reports of tight pitch arrays. And one very common problem of, of folks trying to make MRAM at tight pitch is that during the etching process, you get redeposition of the etched material onto the sidewalls, and it causes shorting of your bits. And that's an example of that as shown in this demo by Samsung in 2011. So you don't get any electrical data. But the best demo that we've seen to date um, so far is, was from SK Hynix and Toshiba in 2016. They did a four gigabit demo at 90 nanometer full pitch with electrical and data. Um, however, if you want to uh, be competitive with the MRAM density, you have to match a 56 nanometer full pitch. That would be for a 1T1R architecture. So in our work to achieve a 50 nanometer full pitch, uh, we started with the MRAM stack, um, a blanket level, and then um, put the hard mask on top. The hard mask is tantalum nitride, diamond-like carbon, and chrome. And then we patterned the hard mask by E-beam, and then um, uh, uh, pattern it by reactive ion etching. Then um, this gives us a hard mask, you can see here in these SEMs, of a very high as, um, aspect ratio. Here's the tilted SEM, and then the top-down view of the hard mask. And then that is used uh, for the INB milling down into the MRAM stack, starting with a low angle for the mill to etch into the depth, and then continue with a high angle mill to um, etch away and remove the redeposited material on the sidewalls to prevent shunting of the devices. And then this is the tilted SEM of the uh, uh, etched MRAM bits. So we don't have um, expensive CMOS of lots of uh, tight pitch transistors. So we try to do what we can with a bottom point contact. And so here's how this uh, process works. Um, we patterned, uh, e-beam patterned, and rye to make uh, individual uh, contact pillars, and then aligned to it also the contact arms, did a dielectric refill and a chemical mechanical polishing polishing to make sure it's really very smooth for the deposition of the MRAM on top. Then we patterned the MRAM at tight pitch um, using the process that I went through earlier. Then a fill with a 
spin on glass for planarization and put a common top electrode on top. And so schematically, it shows this here um, where you have contact to a few individual bits in the array. And then this is how these uh, bottom point contacts um, turned out, then um, adding the arms, and then finally the type pitch array uh, with a few bits contacted. So we took a, a slice through the diagonal here to get these cross-section images that you see here. And so this took um, a lot of uh, sub five nanometer um, e-beam lithography steps. As you can see, the alignment is um, pretty good in this demo here of the bits to the bottom point contacts. And we do indeed confirm physical separation of the bits. We do not have sidewall um, redeposition. And so we were able to do um, electrical measurement and see the switching of these individual bits. And we confirm um, decent magnetic performance because we're able to see 100% in these examples. Okay. So I want to conclude here. My message for today is that we're all using magnetic tunnel junctions to store the data. This is a result of major discoveries and breakthroughs at the basic research level over decades, um, starting from the discovery of spin polarized tunneling, then seeing TMR room temperature and so forth. And advancements continue. Now we have switching by spin transfer torque and that's given rise to SCT MRAM as a non-volatile memory and there are Im embedded products now available. So uh, even as Jonathan said, further innovations need to happen in materials and fabrication and memory architecture to push towards even higher density SDT MRAM with cell sizes 20 nanometers and below. I showed you some examples here from Western Digital where we um, found ways to lower the switching current and to um, pattern MTJs at tight pitch. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention and I wanna thank the folks here